Philip's difficulty with the rhino reveals how we learn about the world around us. The temporal lobes of the brain where Philip's problem is located seem to house specific memory files that help us distinguish one thing from another. And there are files within files that enable us to tell one animal from another, one face from another face. Philip's accident shattered these memory files. We don't have exactly the same systems involved in recognizing animals and recognizing objects. You happen to have lost the animals part, which in your case, given that you're living in a city and you're a 20th century man, this is not a dire problem. If, however, you were a hunter-gatherer and you weren't quite sure what animal was coming at you, it could be a very serious problem indeed. When he's stumped, Philip often resorts to a roundabout way of solving the problem by trying a Sherlock Holmes-like deduction based on little clues. Golden colour, golden colour, golden colour, golden colour, lions, tigers. They're big, they're obviously vicious because they're caged in. I'll go for lions, but a guess, a big guess. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me what's interesting about all this is there's this tacit taxonomy mm. going on all the time in your brain, this obsessive need to classify things. Help me, girls. What is it, please? It's a rhino. It's a rhino. And, of course, this is tremendously useful for survival because you need to know yeah, whether these animals in general are mean predators. These animals are generally prey. Mm. Here is a mate, not a particular mate, but a potential mate. Now, Philip obviously has problems recognizing many different categories of objects. But the most important category, in many ways, for us humans, because we are such highly social creatures, is interaction between people, which involves recognizing faces. I don't know. I can't place you in any situation. Is it a man or a woman? It's a woman, obviously. Dressed up to look younger. Donald Duck for all I know. I don't, I don't know. I'm going to try and draw a famous personality on the board and see if you can identify who it is, OK? Now, in addition to his other visual problems, Philip does have prosopagnosia, the inability to recognize people's faces. I don't recognize faces. To get beyond this, I pick up on everything, clothes. Hairstyles, nose, moustache. But Philip's deductive process is not always reliable. Sometimes he misreads a clue and draws the wrong conclusion. Famous movie star? I can't name her, no, but if I'm correct, we're going back to the 50s, 60s. And you're not telling me anything about the expression on your face. Yes, she married into royalty because she married into, oh, what's the country? In Europe, gambling, Monte Carlo. I can't name her. Does she look beautiful to you? Or sort of so-so? Going by that picture, no. But... I feel of, it's of, by a reputation that yes, she was. Okay. By a reputation that yes, she was a very attractive woman. Philip is not often this mistaken. Usually, his intelligent alertness to clues sees him through. It's only when he's caught out in the most ordinary situation that it becomes clear how great his loss is. Shortly after we tested him in the laboratory, we engineered a chance encounter with Roz on the street to see if he would recognise her out of context. Do you want me to actually approach him? Yeah. Just go and say hello. OK. Do that. Hello, Philip. Roz. Got me. Well done. Didn't you recognise me? I didn't, no. Same when you spoke. Only when I spoke? Only when I spoke, yeah. yeah. If I hear them speak, then I'm in heaven. Because I can identify persons by the voice. 
Although Philip fails to recognize Roz visually, his auditory recognition system is still intact. As soon as he hears Roz, all the correct associations and feelings flood in. I walk straight past you, because I don't recognize people. Sorry. <laughs> Okay, just wanted to see whether that makes me rude. No, I want to It turns out that Philip's flood of emotion plays a vital role in the act of recognition. I can walk straight past somebody. There are many components to even the simple act of recognizing somebody's face. The most obvious component is the ability to look at that person and know who he is, um, his name, his identity, and what that person means to you. In other words, everything you associate with conscious recognition of faces. But in addition to that, you have to assign an emotional significance to what you're looking at, especially if it's a face. Is this a terrifying face of somebody who I don't like? Could it be my boss? Could it be an enemy? Could it be an animal like a lion? Or maybe it's something neutral. There is a very rare neurological condition called the Capgra delusion, where the emotional response to who we're looking at gets disrupted. The effect of this on our reaction to familiar faces is extraordinary. David woke up one day convinced that his parents were imposters. David presented Dr. Ramachandran with one of the strangest cases he has ever encountered. Two years ago, David was involved in a terrible car accident while driving back to California from Mexico. There was a problem with the car, and I landed in the highway with my head first. Okay. Like this truck that is coming by. For five weeks, David lay in a coma. Serious injuries led to the loss of his right arm. But to everyone's relief, when he came round, his mental capacities seemed to be intact. He was articulate, he was intelligent, not obviously psychotic or emotionally disturbed. Uh, he could read a newspaper, everything seemed fine except he had one profound delusion. He would look at his mother and he would say, this woman, doctor, she looks exactly like my mother, but in fact, she's not my mother, she's an imposter. She's some other woman pretending to be my mother. <laughs> The injury to the temporal lobes of David's brain had brought on a very rare condition called the Capgra delusion. The Capgra delusion is a tragic revelation of the vital role played by our emotions in the act of recognition. I was cooking dinner and he probably didn't like the food that night. Okay. And, and he said, you know, the lady who comes in the morning, she cooks much better than you. Okay. It's, a, it's that lady, I like that lady very much. <laughs> but the lady was me, of course, all the time. David was also convinced that his father was an imposter. He would say to his dad, you know, I'm sure you would like to meet this guy. I'm going to let you know this man because I'm sure you'll like it. He looks so much like you, but he drives better. He doesn't go so fast. I would like you to meet him because he looks a lot like you. After two months of this disturbing behavior, David's parents decided to seek help from Ramachandran, who they'd heard had an interest in such cases. But when you looked at the person who looked like your father, what was your feeling? Did it look like there's some other person who resembles your father? Is not really your father, something like that? Did exactly. Yeah. There's a difference of the fact that I know that that person happens not to be my father. Uh-huh. What was going on? Why was this gentleman there who, who looked like your father? If somebody who looks identical right. or very close to my father or my mother, the fact that that person it is not my father or my mother, right? Okay. I don't expect things from that person as I would expect from my parents. No. They I got to come on. The teacher today. David didn't only have these upsetting delusions about people. He even believed that his own home was a replica. One day he started getting really angry. I want to go to my house. I want to go to David's house. I want to go to David's house. And we're in the apartment. And I'm just going, what am I going to do? So I decided, I said, okay, David, let's go. So I took him down the stairs 